be here with you, and it's great to see such a wonderful crowd out there. And I'm happy to hear that it's a mixed crowd, that there are Republicans and Democrats and Independents and people maybe who haven't even picked a party um, to be a part of. Because in the job I want to do, I have to represent everyone, whether they vote for me or not. And I have a track record of doing that at the state level, and I want to take that to Washington. So I'm here tonight, and I consider this really the start of a job interview. And, and I have to say, it's a very important job. Now, Arizona has only had 12, 12 senators in our time as a state. So we're getting number 13 come 2018. So, so we have a big, big opportunity to be able to, um, to get someone new in there, a new voice, a powerful voice, a, a fearless voice, a bold voice. Now, so I'm interviewing to be your next United States Senator, but more importantly, I'm interviewing to be you, to be your voice, to be your backbone, to be the person who puts your great ideas forward on the national and even international stage. So hopefully tonight, after, after we get out of here, you're going to want to hire me to send me to, to Washington, D.C. to do this very important job. I see a lot of ward stickers and ward buttons out there right now. I would love to see everybody have a sticker, a button, a bumper sticker, a yard sign whenever you leave this place because, um, because I think that what you're going to hear tonight is going to be the, the kind of person that you want to see in Washington, D.C. So my plan is to tell you a little bit about myself because I don't know all of you. I know some of you, but I don't know all of you. Uh, tell you about my policy passions and then let you know how things are going in the race. And then we'll spend the rest of the time taking questions until these guys kick me off the stage. And by the way, Noel and David are amazing representatives. You guys are very, very lucky. <laughs> Because I know as a rural re legislator myself, you know, my roots are rural. I grew up in West Virginia, and I live in Lake Havasu. And I know I had to join with these guys and many of the other rural legislators many times as we took on the great state of Maricopa at times. <laughs> because sometimes the great state of Maricopa, they've got a lot of people in a, in a small uh, area, and they start to think that if it's good for Phoenix, it's good for all of, the, all of Arizona. And we know that that is not always the case. So we sometimes had to band together to be able to shine a light and put some common sense forward so that, that we got good policy put before us. So to, to start off, I'll let you know I am Dr. Kelly Ward. I'm a military wife. My husband, Mike, and I have been married for almost 23 years. It'll be 23 years in July. Mike's in the back. Wait, baby. He's right back there. He served in the military honorably for 33 years, and he just retired in June, and so we're very, very proud of him, and we are a patriotic, America-loving family. We've got three awesome kids, Katie, Cameron, and Nick. Katie's working on the campaign. I don't know where she is. She might be out in the hall, but she's, she's right on the campaign trail with us. And uh, by trade, I, oh, there she is. Hi, Katie. There's my Katie right there. <laughs> We're very, 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 very blessed to have her with us on the campaign trail. By trade, I'm a family physician. So a lot of people will say, what's, you know, what's the doctor for? It's for being a family doctor, a generalist, a person who's taking care of a, a lot of different kinds of problems. I uh, owned my own practice in Lake Havasu City for over 10 years with my mom. Now, my mom is also here. You know, I'm getting there to introduce my whole family. So where are you, mom? Oh, there she is. So she's taking pictures, too. So this is my mom. <laughs> And my mom is Dr. Lorraine Bird. And so I, I do have to share a tiny story because my mom, you know, really was instrumental in making me the person that I am today, the woman that I am today, the mom that I am today. Um, and so my mom's story is very interesting because she was an elementary school teacher for 16 years in the public school system. And unfortunately, she and my dad got divorced. And so she was at the, at the doctor with my brother who always had ear infections, and she was lamenting that she always wanted to be a doctor, but that it was just too late for her. And our family doctor said, why don't you do it? You should go for it. Why don't you apply to the, you know, to the osteopathic school in particular in West Virginia, because they're always looking for people with life experience because they felt like a, that you, you're a better doctor. The more life experience you have, the better you can take care of patients. And so that lit a little bit of a spark in, in her. And she came home and she talked to my brother and I, and she said, 
I think I'm going to go to medical school. And we told her, go for it, Mommy. You know, you've always told us that we can achieve anything. That if we put our mind to it and we work hard, we can do it. And so she started medical school when she was 42 and became a pediatrician and has a, had that second career um, as, as a doctor in Lake Havasu. And so we do joke because when she was 42, she went to medical school. When I was 42, I ran for office the first time. And we do wonder what Katie's going to do when she's 42. Uh, it was kind of like a midlife crisis for, for women in our family, I guess. But we know that whatever Katie chooses to do, she's going to be successful. So I took those skills as a wife and a mom and a business owner and a physician a trained healer and a trained problem solver. And I put them to work in the Arizona State Senate. Now I will tell you, I never thought that I would ever run for office. I, I, it was the furthest thing from my, my mind. But Obamacare raised its ugly head and I found myself saying, why doesn't somebody do something? Why doesn't somebody stop this? And I finally had to look at my hands and look at myself in the mirror and say, why don't I do something? I have skills and talents and abilities, and I have been blessed with so much. I shouldn't be hoarding it just to my, my family or my patient population. There might be something I can do on a bigger scale. And at that time, Arizona was considering state-based exchanges and Medicaid expansion, two of the three tenets of Obamacare. And so I ran for the state senate. Against all odds, I was able to be elected because Many people told me I hadn't paid my dues and it wasn't my turn. Now my answer to that was turns gave us Bob Dole, John McCain, and Mitt Romney, and didn't give us the White House. So we had to throw those turns out the window and get the right person. And I was able to get there, and I was able to be a very effective Arizona State Senator. And in my last year alone, in 2015, I got 19 bills of my own signed into law as well as I was signed on to 18 more as a co-sponsor. So 37 bills that I worked on got signed into law that year. And the way that happens is by putting forward great policy ideas. It's about the policy. And that policy, the left and the right, had really no choice but to agree that, that it was good for their constituents and for our state because the majority of my bills were bipartisan bills. And then I learned that I had the special skills to navigate the swamp, <laughs> to navigate that murky process of getting things from the Senate to the House and to the governor's desk. And so those great ideas that we like to talk about actually got put into action. And I think that that's why people wanted to, me to run for the United States Senate, because we don't see a lot of action at the federal level. We see a lot of talk. We see a lot of rubbing elbows with the Global Tuxedo Club. But we don't see a lot of results. And I can tell you that President Trump certainly needs conservative reinforcements, especially in the United States Senate, and really especially from the great state of Arizona. So I'm looking forward to that. That is the most important thing, is the policy. I will tell you, I am an America first candidate through and through. So I want to stand up for the things that President Trump trumpeted on the campaign trail in 2016. Because many of those things I have been fighting for before, before I ever went to the legislature, before Donald Trump came on the scene, a lot of them stem from Tea Party ideals of small government, low taxes, personal responsibility, and following the Constitution. I am so glad that President Trump picked up that leadership mantle and has been charging ahead to get things done. So first and foremost, my number one priority when I get to Washington, D.C. will be to secure the border, stop illegal immigration, and build the wall. Now, we, we know the burdens that illegal immigration have had on every aspect of our society. From healthcare that I saw every day in my practice, every day that I worked in the emergency department, to education, that we're seeing the fallout from, from that with the Red for Ed movement and, and not having enough resources to go around, to public safety and corrections, and really to our very American culture. Now, I just went down to the border. I was in the Tucson sector in March, and I was in the Yuma sector 
in April. And there, there are different things that are going on in those two sectors. Actually, Tucson is probably the worst of all of our sectors across the entire southern border. It is the most open and, and the least secure. Yuma has some fencing, and it was interesting to talk to some of the business people there because, and some of the law enforcement. So the law enforcement told us about before there was any fencing, they would have something called bonsai attacks. And 200, 300 illegal aliens would rush the border, knowing that there were only so many resources on our side to stop them. They knew a few of them would get caught, but that the majority would be able to get through. And so those things stopped almost immediately when the fencing went up. I met with, with a construction, uh, you know, he owns his own construction building, business. And he said, uh, one of the guys that works with him, his truck was stolen about, you know, every month. He, his truck would be stolen and be gone. But as soon as that fencing went up, that also ceased. Now, the border is a lot of things, but secure is not one of them. When I went down to Aravaca in the Tucson sector, I met with a rancher named Jim Chilton. And Mr. Chilton is just the nicest, nicest man. He has been in that part of the state for about 30 years. His family has been in Arizona for five generations. And um, he took me, well, he has a ranch that's about 55,000 acres that he works, cattle ranch. And so he took me down to the border. He has about 25 miles of border with Arizona here and Mexico there. And do you know what secures that border? No. Well, nothing in many places, but there, there, in some places there are four flimsy strands of barbed wire. And, uh, and that's it. And so Mr. Chilton is 79, and he is very spry, and he's a cowboy. You guys know, you're, you guys have a lot of cowboys in, in Prescott. Um, so he's got his jeans, he's got his boots, he's got his hat on, he's got his sidearm, and he gets down on the ground and he wriggles under the barbed wire, stands up on the other side and says, look, I'm in Mexico, pushes down that top, top you know, row of barbed wire and steps right over and comes back and says, if I can do that, Anybody can. Anybody can. And he said, over the last 10 to 12 years, I've noticed a big change in the people who are coming across that border. He said, you know, 12, 15 years ago, it was the immigrants or the migrants. It was people who were coming across that border to get a better life for themselves, to make money, and then to return home, mostly to Mexico. They didn't care about politics. They didn't care about waving a Mexican flag. They didn't care about Democrats or Republicans. They just wanted to work. But he said in the last 12 to, you know, 10 to 12 years, he has noticed that now it's the druggers, okay? And that's the drug cartel. They're, they're people associated with the drug cartel. And they are people that want to do harm to our country. They're bringing dangerous drugs, illegal weapons, and they are trafficking in people. Now, I'm, I'm reading a book about how the border crisis is affecting every single community in every single state right now. And when you look at the drug crisis and the opioid crisis and the overdoses that are happening in our country, we have to secure the border. But when you look at the people that are being trafficked, that is something that all of us, no matter what party you're in, should be thinking about from a humanitarian perspective. Because those children and those women who are brought from one country to another through Mexico to that very open border that just has barbed wire and, and holes are basically tortured that entire time that they come across that, that desert. They're raped multiple times. 80 to 90% of the women are raped again and again. They have rape trees to, for the, the coyotes to celebrate their conquests. And what the druggers have found out is that they can sell a gun once. They can sell a drug once. But they can sell a person again and again and again. So anybody who claims to be an advocate of women's rights and children's rights should be crowing from the mountaintops that we need to build the wall. So I will fight for your support. Priority, but just to you know to kind of keep track of the list but number two is that we have got to fully repeal Obamacare
stand up here as a physician and as a patient myself and not tout that because Obamacare has been horrific to people across the board and it, it was supposed to provide health care to people but instead it, it raised the prices and it decreased access to care so we've got to pull it out by its roots it's got to go and we need a health care expert like me to go to Washington to do it because not only did I own my own business in a primary care field, I also did my master's in public health with an emphasis in health policy. I was the director of medical education at Kingman for seven years and have been involved in the medical education process for over 20 on faculty at both of the osteopathic medical schools in our state. I worked in a community health center as a medical director for a little over, over two years, two and a half years. Um, worked in the emergency department, which is in the trenches medicine, believe me. And, um, and then I got to take all of that knowledge and I got to actually make health policy as a state senator. There are very few people who have the breadth of knowledge and experience that I do in the healthcare arena. And so I want to go to Washington to help solve that problem. Because what I want to see is people actually get health care instead of a piece of paper that's promising them insurance rather than actual care. Uh, socialized medicine is not the way to go. Single payer is not the way to go. You guys probably heard the story of baby Alfie, right? Okay, we don't want any baby Alfies uh, from America. We cannot, I mean, uh, as a mom, imagining having a very, very sick baby and the doctors not being the people that were in charge, the parents not being the people that were in charge, but the government, the government, hold, basically holding these parents prisoner in a hospital with their dying child after they removed any kind of life-saving resources from him, when they had opportunities to do something else. If, if, if we, if we allow universal health care, which is a complete misnomer, as the Democrats are prone to do sometimes, sorry if there's Democrats out there, they love to rename things to make them sound good, but it, it is not good. Uh, so if you just think about a baby Alfie, there's much more that, that, that would be horrific, but that, that we really can't allow to happen. So what I want to see is the free market come back into health care. And we can do that by implementing health savings accounts across the board, regardless of age or socioeconomic status. Medicaid patients can get a little bit of assistance so that they are able to have the health care that they need. Because many times our Medicaid population is relegated to second or third class care or can't even get the care that they actually need because it's not a covered service. Our working age adults should be able to put away as much money as they see fit to take care of their health care needs. It's your money. Why should you be dumping it into the black hole of government or into the deep pockets of the insurance ag agencies and industry? We, we shouldn't. We should be able to use that money. It should be tax-free, and we should be able to pass it on. And Medicare age patients should be able to use their Part C benefits as a health savings account so that they don't have to worry about the donut hole. And they can go to whatever provider they see fit, whether it's Mayo Clinic, or anybody should be able to see, seek alternative care. They should be able to go to a naturopath, or an acupuncturist, or a massage therapist, whatever, whatever um, health care they want to have. Because most of the time, if you want those services, you have to pay your big insurance premium anyway, and then pay out of your pocket to get the care that you actually are seeking. So we've got a lot of work to do on that you know, on, on health care. The other piece of that puzzle is asking people, encouraging people, educating people about why they should have a major medical uh, insurance policy. Not mandating people, but I think that those can be very low cost and they can cover true health emergencies like car accidents or cancer or pregnancy or long-term very expensive chronic illnesses and even, later in life, long-term care. So if we do those two things, implement health savings account, because they are the only thing that have been proven to increase access, increase quality, and decrease cost, and encourage people to have a low-cost, catastrophic insurance policy, we will go a long way to solving the healthcare ills that face this country. And I look forward to getting there and doing it. 
Number, oh, thank you. Number three. <laughs> and that is maintaining the economic growth that we are seeing since President Trump got into the White House. Uh, it has been spectacular. The tax cuts were a great first step in the right direction, but we have more work to do. We can't just look at the tax code every 31 years. We've got to be continuously improving that process. I would love to see the tax cuts become permanent for individuals so that we can continue to have some of those crumbs in our pocket that Nancy Pelosi talks about. Uh, you know, I like those crumbs. I don't know if anybody else, yeah, I like the crumbs. They should, you know, I want to keep those in people's pockets. Um, we also have to look at the other side of the coin. And the other side of the coin is we have to cut spending at the federal level. We have to balance the budget. Senator Rand Paul with what he proposed just yesterday that came to the floor. Uh, he's proposing the penny plan. And the penny plan is that the government agencies and departments <coughs> need to cut one penny from every dollar that they spend. We need to quit counting, um, not increasing their spending as much as we would have as a spending cut. We have to actually cut the current spending, if we really want to balance the budget, and I do, because I want to leave this place a better better place for my daughter and for her future kids and for future generations for all of us. So it's, it's disappointing when only 21 senators voted to balance the budget in five years, 21 Republican senators. Um, it's disappointing when the omnibus bill or bills like the omnibus bill come before Congress. The omnibus bill that just passed a few weeks ago was horrific. It was full, full, full of poison pills that we shouldn't have to swallow. It busted every budget cap that they put in place for themselves. And it was thrust upon all of us and President Trump in a way that was, uh, was really unacceptable. Now, I do have to say, I wish he would have vetoed it. I do wish he had vetoed it because I am not that um, he didn't have much of a choice because he had a veto-proof majority and it was the day before the government was going to shut down and there was a, a crisis created that, that he averted. Now, in that bill, in case you all don't know, there was $500 million, half a billion, for Planned Parenthood. Yeah. To me, that's unacceptable and it's not a poison pill that I'm willing to swallow. We've been forced to swallow that again and again and again, and it's one of the reasons our country is so sick. And Planned Parenthood is taking that money. I don't know if you all heard, they're going to spend you know, $30 million or something on lobbying efforts. So we just gave them half a billion. They're going to spend a lot of it to try to displace Republicans. Even here in Arizona, they've started a new giant PAC headquarters right down in Phoenix because they want to turn this state blue. I don't want to see that happen. That bill also fully funded Obamacare, even though the Republicans, our Republicans, tell, tell us that it's gone. But it's not gone, it's still there if we're fully funding it. It did include some, uh, some spending for border security and for building walls, just in the Middle East, not in the United States. <laughs> it did not include one new dollar for our wall. And it also cut, it cut resources for ICE. That's unacceptable. There were two people that voted for the bill, in case you guys were wondering. One Republican, my opponent, Martha, and one Democrat, my other opponent, Kirsten. And so they're, they're kind of similar in their big government, big spending ways. So we've got to be very, very careful. The thing that I was heartened about was President Trump looked into that camera. He looked into every one of our eyes, and he said, I will never sign another bill like this this. I believe them. You believe them? <laughs> but what we can do to bring fiscal sanity to Washington, D.C. is to send different people to the House and to the Senate. That's, yes. So that, that they never, we can send people who will never send a bill like that to President Trump or to any other executive. So
So that's what we've got to do. We've got big, big work that we have to do on the economic front if we want to continue the growth and control the spending, cut the spending, so that we can leave this, this country a better place for our future generations. And last, you guys can cheer for that, right? You're like, yes, last, last, but no, certainly not least. <laughs> certainly not least. Uh, my, my last policy passion is for our military and our veterans. into the war zone in Iraq, wondering if he was coming back at all, or if he was coming back the same guy that I sent there. Fortunately for us, we were blessed, and he came home whole. So I know how important it is to make sure that our military, our men and women serving, have the resources that they need. They have the training that they need. They have the equipment that they need. Um, our military needs to be the strongest military in the world. to be the strongest is not because we want endless war or occupation or expensive nation building or to be the policemen of the world, but because we want the Reagan doctrine of peace through strength. Yes, yes. I think that we're seeing that play out on the, on the international stage right now because we are strong. Our country, we have a strong leader in the White House. We have a strong commander in chief. We have somebody who says what he means. And we're seeing things turn around for the world with getting out of the Iran deal. That was ridiculous. It was a, a crazy deal. And I'm so glad that Donald Trump has pulled us out of that. <laughs> we see talks with North Korea. Now they're kind of going back and forth and back and forth because China's kind of, you know, throwing their weight around. But the talks are in, in progress. They are potential to denuclearize the Korean pe Peninsula and bring North and South Korea back together. That's amazing. Our, our hostages, we got three hostages back from this brutal regime uh, in North Korea. We got them back and they didn't come back in the condition of Otto Warmlier. Yeah. They came back healthy and alive, thank the Lord. And so that's because we are operating from a position of strength again in the world. Now, we stay strong by taking care of our veterans. So our, we've been playing political football with our veterans for far too long, left and right, using them as political pawns, and it's got to stop. I like to see some of the changes that are happening with implementation of the Choice Program, with the changes of leadership at the VA, um, but we have got to keep a very, very close eye on this and make sure that things are delivered to all veterans. Some veterans get great care, but some don't. So we have to make sure that we're delivering to those people who signed on the line to maintain our liberty and our freedom. It's, they're not, there's not that many. I know in Arizona we feel like there's veterans everywhere. But if you go to other states, you don't see our veterans. They, they, aren't, they aren't there. So we see them every single day and we have to take care of them. And we're seeing the problems of not taking care of them on the other side with our fighting force. The Army just reported that they haven't met their recruiting goals. And I think some of that is because these patriotic young men and women think twice before they, they go into the military because they say, they didn't take care of my uncle, they didn't take care of my mom, they didn't take care of my grandpa or my dad, will they take care of me? We have to make sure that the people who are willing to go into battle uh, voluntarily, are, uh, they know that we are going to deliver our promises on the other side. So if we do those four things, secure the border, repeal Obamacare, grow the economy and cut spending, and we build our military and take care of our veterans, we are going to go a long way to keeping America great in 2018, 2020, and And I will have to tell you that I am more than ready to get there and get the job done. The campaign is going amazingly well, so you all know. Um, we are leading in the polls in the primary, 36, 27, 22, and we're seeing that spread out, <laughs> spread out uh, quite dramatically, and I do travel all over the state. Just this week, I've been in Flagstaff, Tucson, Scottsdale, Prescott now, and then tomorrow I am going to Saddlebrook. 
So uh, I am traveling the state. I am meeting with voters just like you. I'm hearing what their policy passions are, and I can see that that poll is very, very accurate because what we're seeing is that the Jeff Lake brand of politician has a ceiling. Yeah. We, we, you know, Mitch McConnell and Chuck Schumer, they want to play here. Okay, they want to play in Arizona. Mitch has chosen Martha. Chuck has chosen Kirsten. I think we, the people, should choose who our next senator will be. Don't you? Yeah. So we're going to send a message to the swamp. We're going to let them know what we want. So that Jeff Lake 2.0 type politician has a ceiling of about 27 to 30 percent. And the rest of us want something different. We want someone inspiring and motivating and energizing and honest, authentic, and accessible. So those are the things that I offer. And I think that as I build the two-way relationship here, it's not just a job interview tonight. It's the beginning of building a lasting two-way relationship. One that we have to have if we truly want a representative republic. I, you know, I don't ever want to be a, a representative that comes, talks at you, and then runs out the door because that's not how I can be you in Washington, D.C. I've got to have that open two-way communication, so I look forward to that here in just a few minutes with the questions and beyond. Uh, we've got a great team in place for the campaign. We've got Ed, Ed Rollins as my senior campaign advisor. Now, for the, there are some young people out there. Ed Rollins was... Ronald Reagan's campaign manager in his reelect. So I can't do better than that. And I'm very, very humbled because Mr. Rollins has, has called me the face of the new Reagan revolution. And it's a lot of pressure, but I am willing to take on that mantle. <laughs> that puts forward great policies. And I was glad to hear you guys say, you're not gonna change your stripes, you're gonna do what needs to be done and stay conservative. Because believe me, a message of liberty, a message of freedom, a message of the government getting out of people's way really resonates across the board with Republicans, with independents, with, with conservative Democrats, and with people who, who don't think about politics at all. So we need to stick with that message because it is a successful message. It's the message that leads to prosperity, that leads to safety, and that leads to American greatness. And so we've, we've got to stick with it because that's how we're going to win. We've got people that are working on this campaign that were for the, from the Trump campaign, from the Cruz campaign, from the Rand Paul campaign, from the Carson campaign, from the Giuliani, Giuliani campaign. So we've got a lot of big, heavy hitters that are helping us to be able to move forward in the right direction, to raise the money that we need, to raise the awareness that we need, and to stay connected with all of you. So, so take heart. Though it is going to be a, a, a hard year, I feel very, very confident that we are not going to see a blue wave, that we are going to see a, a conservative revolution, a new Reagan revolution, of people standing up to take our government back from the swamp creatures that are in Washington, D.C., left and right. So I'll tell you this, what I want to see is AZ in D.C., not D.C. in AZ. How about you? <laughs> and I will, I'm going to just promise you one thing from up here. What I want to do, what I want to join with you to do, is to bring the heat to drain the swamp. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. One second before the question. Okay, see, my, my family is back there waving at me because I didn't say. Okay, we've got a sign-in sheet. We would love to have some information from you so that we can let you know the next time I'm going to be in Prescott. And yes, there will be a next time that I'll be in Prescott. When I was down in Tucson this week, they, they, that was one of the questions I got from the audience. I'm, I hope I'm not stealing anybody's thunder. Was we never see our representative who is running against me, and we never see our senators. Are you going to come back? And my answer is a resounding yes. So please get give us some information so that we can stay in touch. Katie and Megan are going to be passing around some some clipboards to get that information. You'll notice we don't have our, our petitions because I've already turned those in. 
I turned in over 12,000 signatures. Right at the beginning of the month. So we are on the ballots. Oh, and Zach is holding up the envelope, the ever famous envelope, because we do need financial resources to be able to get to Washington. Uh, you know, if you can donate something, anything, five dollars buys us two yard signs. Two of these yard signs, if you put them up in your yard, it can reach about about thirty thousand voters each. So don't think that any amount is too small. There is an amount that's too much. You can't give over twenty seven hundred dollars. So there's no amount too small, but there is an amount too much. So um, anything between one dollar and twenty seven, we we welcome, and we have envelopes out there to. Uh, to help you to be able to donate to us and contribute to this effort. So with that, I will turn it over to you and I will take some questions. I'm ready to take the heat. If you have your cell phone still on, some of you do, would you please turn off the alerts? Turn off your alerts. Unless you have really good music. So, <laughs> well, I might start dancing, that's the yes. problem. Well, that's true, that's true. Okay. Um, Dr. Ward, you've already answered some of the questions that are on here, so I'm going to try to be sensitive to that as I'm asking these questions. If any of you have more cards, I just received another card. Please uh, bring them up to me. Yeah, she's the one with the highest heels on, so she's going to be the one. Yeah, so she's going to, I'm going to have to like, not talk while she's walking. It's so all right, so uh, I have read all of these cards. I combined maybe two or three of them because they were the same question. Um, so they may not be your words exactly, so please, I had somebody come up to me on the last one and say, why didn't you read my question? I said, well, I, I'm asking this question. I said, well, I didn't read your question, but I asked that question. So um, first question, and it comes from me, <coughs> and it's basically on the veterans. With all the funds given to welfare recipients, non-citizens, and the illegal aliens, do you think we can find the money there to instead take care of our veterans and our currently serving troops? Yes, 100%, I do. I do, I think that America is getting its priorities back in order. Uh, if they got out of order in the last eight years, well, yeah, not the last one and one year and four or five months, but the eight years before, we kind of got our priorities out of order as a country. We have to prioritize taking care of our veterans and making sure our military is strong. And there is fat in the budget in the, in the places that you mentioned. So yes, we definitely can. Okay, as a senator, you will be um, responsible to confirm certain government positions. How would you have voted for the CIA director and would you have, um, would you have faced her to, to or forced her to disavow her stance, her position on uh, waterboarding, I would say, specifically? I think Gina Haspel was very well qualified for that position, that she uh, worked her way up through the ranks, 36 years in the CIA, starting basically as a grunt and working her way all the way to the top, I think is quite spectacular. I think that anything she did while she was in the CIA was done under orders and what it was, it was uh, approved by Congress and by the President at that time. And I don't think it's right to make anyone disavow or to claim that something is moral or immoral. That is a personal decision that people uh, understand. And hopefully the people that we are putting into positions of power have a strong moral compass to understand the difference between right and wrong. To understand that there are things that are much more important than politics in their life. Faith, family, community, profession, those things are all way above politics. And some of the people who were asking the questions of, of Ms. Haskell were, were doing it for political gain for themselves rather than looking out for what's best for our country. And that's what we have to get back to. Rather than the political grandstanding that we see from our Senate committees and our House committees, we have to get back to looking at the qualifications. I mean, and with, with, with Haskell, I think that she was a, a great person. Looking at judges, okay, when we're looking at who we're going to confirm as federal judges, my criteria is, are they strict constructionists? Are they in the mold of Justice Scalia, who understood that the Constitution says what it says, and it doesn't say what it doesn't say? So those are the kinds of people that I want to look for if I am so fortunate to be in a position to be able to confirm justices or other people that will be elevated to positions of power in our country. 
What is your stance on the Second Amendment? Explain all you know. I'm sure they mean the Second Amendment there. It's not a two-part question. All I know, no. I know, I know at least a little bit about a lot of things because I'm a generalist, but I'm never afraid to get a specialist. That's the beauty of being a family physician. Uh, but I am 100% pro-Second Amendment. I, I sponsored the Second Amendment Protection Act every year that I was in the Arizona legislature. Uh, unfortunately, I was never able to get it signed into law, but it's moved through a little bit more each year, which is great. It seems crazy that we have to have a law to protect one of our God-given rights in our state, but sometimes you have to go to those measures to make sure people understand that that right shall not be infringed. I describe myself as a liberty-loving, constitutional, conservative Republican, and I think that that is the brand of Republican that we need to send to Washington. Yeah. This is a, <laughs> along these lines, can the Congress require states to increase school safety, metal detectors, dedicated entrances and exits, staffed by law enforcement? We don't want to lose our gun ownership rights. I don't think that that is a place for federal politicians to be getting involved, though they do want to stick their nose in all the time, because back to the grandstanding. I think that that is something that our local school boards uh, and, and our State Department of Education, and even maybe the legislature can work on with our education community, because there is no gun law. There is no gun law, no new gun <coughs> law, that would have stopped what happened today. Not one. Not that would have stopped what happened in Parkland, that would have stopped any of these atrocities. Take, that's right. <laughs> Taking away the God given right that our Constitution assures to keep and bear arms, to protect ourselves, our families, and our property is not the direction that we should take. The knee jerk reaction of politicians, especially on the left, is to try to infringe upon those rights. There are many, many places that we can work to ensure that our kids are safe at school. Number one, those schools should be hardened targets. They should not be sitting ducks where any person who has a weapon can go in there and kill at will. Uh, we, can't, we can't allow it to continue. We have to look at the policies that are in place in terms of our, our uh, federal policies that are encouraging some schools to diminish the crimes of certain certain young people in order to look better than, um, than they might otherwise. We have to have accountability of people who do wrong. We have to look at the policies of our, our uh, law enforcement so that they are rushing in to, to stop a shooter rather than staying outside till someone gives them an order. And, um, and we also have to look at the failures of our mental health system and really as from you know, our society. As we've, as we've become more digitally connected, we've become less connected as humans. And we've got to bring that humanity back. We've got to look to these kids who have troubled upbringings, who are uh, wearing shirts that say born to kill and putting themselves out on the internet. We need to reach out to them with love and care and compassion rather than pushing them off to the side or pushing them off on someone else, which has allowed so, you know, these, these few that have committed these horrific acts to turn into monsters. I think that if we get back to our human roots, we're going to go a long way to being able to stop, stop tragedies like what we saw today and, and you know, several times over the last 18, 19 years since Columbine. Okay, these are kind of short answer questions. If they seem to be anyway, probably won't be. I'll try, I'll try. <laughs> Would you support a repeal of the 17th Amendment? Yes, uh, the 16th and the 17th actually. So the income tax I think is a bad idea. Uh, why would we tax? There are plenty of other ways to generate revenue for, uh, for the government. The fair tax is a good way that, that uh, many people have touted, and, and I think that that's a great, great place to start. The 17th is, in case you all don't know, it's the uh, popular election of our senators. So
So you remember Mr. Smith goes to Washington, and I don't mean Steve Smith, because hopefully he will go to Washington, but uh, Mr. Smith goes to Washington, showed the corruption of the special interests as they took over power of the legislative branch, the, the, the state legislative uh, engine, and really bought their way into Biden senators. And so people wanted to stop that. They said, well, let's let the people elect our senators. And the pendulum has kind of swung again to the other side where those special interests now, instead of controlling the state legislature, they control the message that gets out to the voter. They put millions of dollars into elections. Uh, for goodness sake, Hillary Clinton was bragging that she was going to spend a billion dollars on the election. And so that those special interests have really taken hold. Uh, you know, we, we complain that we don't like the performance of our senators in many states, the same, the same message, but we re-elect our senators more than 90% of the time. And so, uh, and I think some of it's because of the popular election and the way it's set up now. So I think that those two things are things that we need to work on. Other things that I would do an amendment to the Constitution, I would, I would support a balanced budget amendment. I would support it, and I would support term limits as a constitutional amendment. <laughs> Common Core, your thoughts? I have been vehemently opposed to Common Core since it reared its ugly head. Uh, unfortunately, I had to go up against two Republican governors on that. Now, when I served with Governor Brewer, she pushed us Obamacare, right? Medicaid expansion, state-based exchanges. She's the one, really, she was the ringleader to bring us Obamacare Medicaid expansion, which is costing the state a lot of money and taking resources away from education. So those of you that are concerned about education, we either educate, Medicaid, or incarcerate. That's where the biggest part of our, our state is where our money goes in the budget. So as, as Medicaid gets bigger, educate gets smaller. So um, that is a, a problem. And, with, with, and, and, and unfortunately, Governor Brewer also brought us Common Core to start with. And I wasn't, I didn't argue that much with Governor Ducey on Common Core in general, but I did, I asked him very nicely and his staff, when I was the chairman of the Education Committee, don't send me any nominees who are pro Common Core. Okay, so I said, I said it nicely, you know, but I also said, because I'm not going to hear them in my committee. So I didn't hear a couple of his nominees in my committee, and I got a lot of flack about it, especially on the last day that we had. They actually brought the nominees and sat them right in front of me so they could give me their little cat eyes like on Shrek, you know the cat with his big eyes and they're sitting there like, please hear me. Um, in the back of the room, there were people from the governor's office shooting daggers at me and also sending notes up to try to force me to hear those nominees. I was getting notes from our chief of staff that I needed to hear the nominees, but I told them, don't bring me pro Common Core nominees. And so I gathered the meeting closed, and that was that. I didn't hear them. I got a lot of, yeah, I got, I, 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 sometimes you have to go up against your own party um, for the good of the people. Unlike Jeff Flake, who said that people should get whatever nominees they put before us, I think that it is the, the Senate's duty to be the last bastion of hope for the people to make sure that the right people get there. Just because someone gets a political appointment from an executive doesn't always mean they are the right person. So you can expect me to fully vet people and then to move people forward who have that great compass to serve us in the best capacity. What Senate committees will you be seeking and why? Well, you know, that's going to be up to the leadership that is in the, the Senate. And I think it kind of puts the cart before the, the horse. So I have to, you know, of course, win the primary, win the general, and then get there. Uh, I would, of course, love to serve on a, a, one of the health-related committees, whether it's the main committee or one of the subcommittees. I think I do have a lot of knowledge there. I would love to be on the judiciary because I would, would – um, would love to be one of the people who got to assure that we got constitutional judges on the bench. Uh, I am interested in international affairs and foreign affairs. I think I could be valuable there as well, but I will serve at the, at the pleasure of leadership and the pleasure of the president wherever they put me. And I know that with my skill set, 
I'll be able to be valuable no matter where it is. I don't expect to be popular there. Just, just so you all know. I, I think I will join with the ranks of the Wacko Birds and the Hobbits with, yeah, you know, um, with, with Ted Cruz and Rand Paul with Mike Lee. Um, I don't expect to have a nice office or um, you know any kind of perks uh, because I'm taking on the establishment. I, I certainly am. And I think that many in the establishment, left and right, sees their empire crumbling. They yeah. see what they've built with their cronies and their friends falling around them. And they are digging in with their fingernails in a death grip trying to hold on to it. I think we have to get light shiners into Washington, D.C. Yeah. Now, people, people have asked me, why did you pick yellow as your campaign color, yellow and red? Um, it's not just because McDonald's and Wendy's and Burger King and all the big yellow and red. Um, it's not because I was a Chi Omega when I was in, in college and knew our colors were cardinal and straw. Um, it, it's not just because it's the color of the Gadsden flag and don't tread on me. It is also because I believe yellow is such a positive, sunny color. It is a color of light and sunshine. It's something that I want to bring to Washington, D.C. I want to hold that torch of liberty high. I want to shine it on the swamp and expose the corruption and the swamp monsters that are there. And I know that um, that's going to be difficult. And I know that there are people that are going to want to extinguish that flame. That's one of the reasons I support term limits is because I think that 12 years, two terms, is more than enough time for anyone to be in Washington, yeah. Yeah. to start an agenda, to accomplish some, <laughs> and to pave the way for the next generation to pick up that torch and to keep it shining bright. There are young people in this room, and I want them to be able to pick up that torch and to keep it shining. Because I think that the longer you're there, the more they try to snuff that thing out. And so I want to pass on a lit torch to that future generation who is going to have the energy and the motivation and the knowledge and the skills to do the job that needs to be done. So, so, so I say, shine a light, expose the corruption, don't stay too long, get the job done, pass it, pass it, and pass it on so the country continues to move in the right direction and we keep America great. Amen. Okay. <laughs> Many people have this concern with uh, Joe Pyle in the race. People fear that he's going to split the vote. Yeah. Sally's going to get in. I understand you, uh, everything's looking good for you right now. And um, they, they want to know how are your positions different than Martha makes Sally. Um, you already answered the question about what are you doing as far as going out into the, uh, uh, the state. And uh, we, we know that your receptions are always good, so that, that was a question, too. I'm, I'm trying to boil these down, because they're ask, you're asking four questions on one part. OK, uh, um, so, uh, our okay so, so OK, wait, so just ask me one at a time. So, so differences between, well, there, there's three of us in the race. And I am leading in the polls. And I'm very well positioned to also win the general election. So, so remember, this isn't just about winning a primary to send a message to the insider establishment on the GOP side. This is about sending the right person to Washington, D.C. to do the job the right way. Sending someone competent, qualified, and capable into that Senate chamber. And I think that as time goes on, and as more and more people come to events like this, as they, they interact with our website, as they meet with our volunteers and our staff members, they see that I am the thoughtful, conservative leader with a proven track record of getting results that should go to Washington. The, the biggest, you know, well, there are many differences between, between Martha and me. Um, first and foremost, I think that I'm actually a conservative. I didn't just become conservative on October 25th. Now, you guys might not realize that on October 24th, Jeff Flake dropped out of the race, okay? And so that, and I think that the 30 points I was up on him probably played a big role in getting a sitting senator to say, no, I'm not seeking re-election, and to retire. Um, so on October 25th was when, when our congresswoman from Tucson decided that she was going to try to fool the people into thinking she's something she's not. She has a track record. She has a voting record. And that's what people have to look at. Don't just look at the things that come in your mailbox almost every single day. She was a pilot. Um, and 
also the, the ads that are going to come out. And I'm sure the attack ads are coming soon, so be watching for those. They'll be coming. Uh, attack ads on me. And um, she, she wants you to believe that she's a border hawk, for example. Now, I have called her a flip-flop border hawk, and I called her, you know, I, I, uh, I was supposed to talk about that today on Barney when I, when I was on Fox Business, but I didn't get to quite talk about as much as I wanted to. But she voted for amnesty nine times. Yep. Nine times. She has said that she doesn't believe that a wall will work. She just had her name removed from a bill for political expediency. She was touting a bill for amnesty for illegal alien children that she started last April touting. In September, she actually sent a letter to Speaker Ryan and demanded that it be brought to the floor to be heard. Then October happened, and suddenly she started to uh, uh, try to align herself with President Trump. Before October 20, 25th, there was not one positive mention of Donald Trump on her social media or website. She refused to help him during the primary season. She allowed Donald Trump to lose her district to Hillary Clinton by five points. She refuses to say if she voted for President Trump. She talked to a group of bankers and told them that Donald Trump was basically an albatross around her neck. And so that doesn't sound like a true supporter of the America First agenda to me. She's also, you know, she was for TPP. She voted with Obama more times than anyone in our delegation and more times than not when he was in office. She voted for his budget-busting omnibus the same way she did just a couple of weeks ago. So if you want a true social and fiscal conservative, there is only one choice in this race, and that is Dr. Kelly Ward. question. So, okay, how are we getting around? Well, I'm traveling around the state. Last night I, I did do a forum with Sheriff Joe. He was there, so, so that was good. Martha wasn't there, but, but the two of us were there. We got to speak and answer questions just like, we're, like what I'm doing here. Um, I would love to see a, a three-way debate with us standing up on the stage together, head-to-head, um, side-by-side, talking about policy, talking about issues, doing it under pressure, and, uh, and sharing our vision for our state, our nation, and our world. We, we the voters, deserve that. This is an, a wide open Senate seat. Wide open. There's no incumbent for the Republican Party to, to protect. It's an open seat. And so we, as the electorate, should demand debates. Because that is the only way that you all are going to see the truth. You, you know, to be you, you can prepare for debates, but you never know what's going to come. You don't know what question is going to be unless you're Hillary Clinton and you talk to John. <laughs> but besides that, inside, in, in reality, in Arizona, you, you know, you're not going to have that luxury. And so we need to demand it. I'd love for you all to talk to the Republican Party, to talk to Chairman Lines, and tell him that you want to see debates. I think that the Republican Party could set it up in a relatively safe environment with moderators who ask us questions that are not gotcha questions, but are questions designed to get to the root of the things that are important to you. Um, and don't let Jonathan wiggle out of it. And I, he knows I've been you know, trying to get people to, to get on his case because he likes to say, it's up to the campaigns to set that up. No, no, no. It's up to the campaigns to say yes or no, we will come to a debate. So I would urge you to push on the party to, to have debates. There are many places and many entities that want to have debates. I hope that my two opponents will agree. I've been out there uh, touting the need for it for quite some time, and I hope that they'll get on board as well so that we are able to choose our next senator in the right way rather than picking you know, whoever has the best ad in your mailbox closest to the day you decide to vote. Two questions she already answered. Will conservative leaders agree to hold rallies for you? Sebastian Gorka was here last month. And will you support Trump? Duh. Okay. So, <laughs> we, we, somebody was at a town hall seven years ago for Senator Flake. He sounded terrific. I got to Washington. What happened? So disappointed. We are so impressed with you since we heard uh, from your uh, 
not sure, oh, interviews, about two, three years ago, are you strong enough to fight the swamp fight? Yes, yes, yes. And I thank you for, for, being, you know, for um, being supportive of me. I will tell you that, you know, I'd love to just say, trust me, I'm a doctor. Uh, but but I, I, I don't want you to trust anybody that's going to Washington. I want you to hold our feet to the fire. And you do that by having the two-way communication, the regular communication, the access that you deserve in a representative republic. And so um, I will stand firm. I have stood firm. I don't know if you all realize, but uh, John McCain and his PAC, the Grassroots Action Pack, which has nothing to do with grass at, grassroots and nothing to do with conservative action, that's for sure, spent almost $18 million in negative attacks against me in 2016. But look, I'm still standing and I'm actually stronger. Uh, <laughs> The, the election, and I'm sorry, I, I do apologize for you all, because to all of you, because had I been there, we would have had the skinny repeal much sooner than uh, than we do now, and uh, things I think would be moving in a in a quicker direction for the America First agenda. But in that election, I did get 40% of the vote in a four-way race. I was able to win five of 15 counties, and in some of the counties, I was you know within. 500 votes of Senator McCain. Uh, I was able to actually win on election day, 51% on election day. The sad part was only 20% 20, 20 of the people voted on election day. Everybody else voted early. I did not, you know, I lost in early voting because I didn't have the money and I didn't have the manpower and I didn't have the experience to be able to do the job that needed to be done. But I'll tell you, this time we do. We have the money, we have the manpower, we have the experience, and we have the heart and the soul of so many, many people. I won't say Republicans, voters. People who had never voted before but voted for Donald Trump the first time. They see, uh, they see a person in me that will go to Washington and do the job that they want done. They see a non-politician in me. They see um, the similarity between Donald Trump and his results-oriented way of leading and the way I have led as, as a community member, as a physician, and as a state senator. So things are looking great. I am more than strong enough. I, of course, like Moses, can't hold my staff up alone. I've got to have you guys hold it up with me because if we do that, we will win the primary, the general, and most importantly, we will send a person to Washington, D.C. to get to work and get the job done in the way that we want to see it to be accomplished. So. This is a great, this is a great segue with a little bit of uh, uh, forward here. I support your message of fiscal responsibility, free market health care, um, border security, smaller government. However, in this increasingly partisan environment, how do you plan to work with both Democrats and um, establishment Republicans to actually move the needle on these issues, which you've talked about a little bit already, but go ahead. Right. Well, I, I mean, I do see myself as somebody who can help to unite the party and unite the people of, of our state and of our, of our nation. Um, I do put people over politics. And I know that the news media, the fake news, I, I, some of it, the, the news is fake, they would love for you all to believe that I'm something that I'm not. But what you need to do is look at my record. Look at my record in the state senate. I did sound, stand firm with conservative principles, with the principles of shrinking the size of government, lowering taxes, uh, decreasing regulations, especially from small businesses so that they could thrive. Uh, and I worked across the aisle. I got people from the Democrat Party to sign on to my legislation because it was good policy. Uh, uh, David Bradley from Tucson, and he hates it when I tell this story, but I'm going to tell it anyway, because he's a Democrat from Tucson. You guys know him. He, he would stand up again and again and say, I can't believe I'm saying this, but it's another good war bill. And that's how I will do it, is I will put forth a good policy. But I also 
believe that our founders created our government in the way that they did so that we would make smaller incremental changes in the right direction. When we make huge sweeping change, there is so much possibility of unintended consequences as well as intended consequences from the swamp that stick things in bills that nobody sees. And so I think that we should strive for single issue bills when possible. I think that they should be written in simple language that's easy to understand. And I think that everything should strive to move the, the, the needle in the right direction. Even if we don't get it all, we should try to get as much as we can and then the next time get a little bit more and the next time get a little bit more. And that's the way we will get our our country back on the right track is by taking those small bites and digesting them and then uh, becoming a healthy body as, as time goes on. So we've got 10 minutes and so I'm gonna I'm gonna try to do a round robin here as best I can. No, uh, don't know if it's gonna work. Um, I will not get to all of your I questions. I think he's saying I talk a lot. No, you're answering <laughs> questions. Um, so we won't get to all of your questions, but I, I have to say there's there's not a, a clunker in here. They're, they're so good. And I'm sitting here sitting going, ah, ah, they're going to hate me. So anyway, do you believe that whole government agencies should be eliminated? Which ones? Yes. And I'll, I'll just give you two off the top of my head. Department of Education, Federal Department of Trade deficits, China, Japan, just trade deficits in general. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I think that Donald Trump is trying to finally even the playing field for the United States of America. For too long, we have been the ones footing the bill. We have been the ones suffering. Our workers and our companies have been put at a disadvantage. And so I'm glad to see that we're trying to get on even footing. I think that Donald Trump proposed proposed a lot of tariffs and a lot of uh, you know things. None of those have gone into effect, just so you all know. But they just talking about them has certainly um, improved the art of the deal for the United States. And so I think he's a master negotiator, and he will never do anything to harm America. He will never do anything to harm Americans, American workers, or American business. Everything that he is doing is designed to move the playing field to an even keel so that we can compete, so that we can have free, fair, and reciprocal trade with the world. And that's what I can say. Global warming, maybe we should take some of that money and give it to the veterans. What do you think about global warming? Well, there has been climate change um, for years, right? It's a, it gets hot, it gets cold, it gets hot, it gets cold. And so we still have not been able to show how much of that is attributable to man or what the long-term effect will be. So I think that the science is still out there and we're still investigating, so it will be interesting to see. But I don't think that we should worship at the altar of global warming and greenism, um, though I do firmly believe in making sure that we take care of our environment, that we have clean air and that we have clean water. And we should be investigating every kind of power that's out there, whether it's nuclear, solar, uh, hydro, wind power, and of course, clean coal and natural gas. Uh, all of those things should be put into, into the hopper so that we, as Americans, are able to have, have uh, energy that is reliable and is cost effective. And so, um, you know, I think that there are some that have moved so far to the progressive left that they would have us not have any lights anymore and not have any cars and you know go back to the days of candlelight and I don't even think they want us to have horses. I guess we'll just have to walk. Um, you know, we're, I, we're never going to go there, but we should strive to utilize all forms of, of energy so that we do have a clean environment, but we should get off the, the, uh, the mantra and the the, the religion. It actually has become a religion of those.
can I make this the last question so that she has a little bit of time to spend with you afterward here? Um, President Trump has, similar to Ronald Reagan, bypassed the entire media uh, in the process. He crushed it, but um, uh, bypassed the entire media by tweeting. Yes. Will you tweet to us? Oh, yes, I will. <laughs> I will tweet to you. I tweet now. Um, so if you're not following me, go to at Kelly Ward AZ on Twitter, on Facebook, on Instagram, on YouTube. I'm not as good on Instagram or YouTube. I'm better on Twitter and, and Facebook. But I do think it's a great way to keep in touch. I've got about a little over 69,000 followers on Twitter. And we went over 100,000 on Facebook, but it kind of goes up and down and up. So we're right at... 100,000, so we can reach a lot of people, which is great, not nearly the 51 plus million that, that President Trump has, but I, I do think it's a great way to communicate directly with constituents, and that includes doing direct messaging on, on those, um, those applications as well, so that you have another avenue to get in touch with the person who is supposed to be you in Washington, D.C. So yes, so join us. Join our social media, join Team Ward, um, and let's drain the swamp. Bring the heat and drain the swamp.